YouTube team at Google, who's going to tell us about his project for TESS. Hi. <laughs> so uh, some disclaimers. Uh, this is the first time I'm talking about this, so it's not rehearsed. So I may fumble around, so excuse me if I do. Um, so as uh, Andrew said, uh, my name is Sugu. I work for the YouTube team. And I'm not part of the Go team, and um, but actually I like them a lot. Uh, we started with us uh, uh, around 2010. That was about three years ago. Uh, that was the time when um, uh, Go was just announced, and uh, people were experimenting. And um, our <coughs> main decision to use Go, um, when you read up about the language, you don't really know how far you can you can go with it. But uh, what the, we made our decision based on uh, the Go team and uh, where they are coming from, how they are thinking. And we kind of liked the way they were thinking. They were minimalist. They were not trying to just keep adding bells and whistles. They were actually trying to remove stuff that is possibly unnecessary, uh, simplify things, and uh, uh, making the right trade-offs. So we felt like they were heading in the right direction in terms of language design and uh, what they wanted. And even their libraries, uh, when we looked at them, looked like it had um, a lot of maturity in how they uh, thought about it. So we uh, took the risk to uh, decide to do this in Go, and uh, <coughs> we don't regret it. Um, if uh, uh, What I would like the outcome of the talk to be is basically say that at this point, if you are on the fence sitting, thinking about using Go. You don't have to worry about it. You can jump in. Um, uh, for example, just to say uh, YouTube completely depends on this server. If our Go servers go down, you will not be able to see a single YouTube page. So that's how much uh, we depend on Go. Um, actually, before I jump into the details, I have a large number of slides. Uh, I wanted to get a quick. Uh, uh, idea about what um, whether you want to hear more about Vitesse or you want to hear more about um, the Go experience that we had, some of the Go stuff. Uh, how about uh, Vitesse? How many of you want to hear about Vitesse? There's like five. How about Go? Uh, five more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so I will probably try to do 50 50 and I'll try to finish about 15 minutes early for questions. So what is Vitesse? It's, uh, it's basically a scalable and efficient storage solution for the web. So uh, in other words, uh, YouTube is a, the ideal customer for Vitesse because that's the reason why we built it. But if you are actually uh, writing a web application and you want a scalable solution, and you're starting off with MySQL, and then eventually when MySQL runs out, you want to know how to scale, you can think about using Vitesse to uh, keep scaling while you continue to use uh, MySQL. Uh, so what does Vitesse give you is, on one side, it gives you a set of tools to manage your MySQL instances. And on the other side, uh, it also gives you a, a set of servers that actually run on top of MySQL that actually optimize MySQL performance, that actually make it uh, go faster, if you can believe it. Uh, I will give you some, uh, share some numbers about how we managed to do that. Um, in terms of uh, this, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with NoSQL and MySQL. Um, on one side, there's uh, the MySQL, which is pretty good to get started. It's relational, which means that it's uh, functionally, uh, functionally very rich. It can do lots of tricks. But it's also uh, because of the fact that it's a relational uh, database at heart, uh, eventually, it runs out of steam when you start to scale. So on one side, that is a problem that MySQL engines have. On the other side, we have NoSQL databases that don't have trouble scaling, but then when your application becomes more complex, you start to run into limitations about what a NoSQL engine can do, especially in the areas of um, um, indexes. They don't support secondary indexes. They don't support joins. Uh, I think people are, uh, they are, it's mainly because NoSQL engines are still relatively new. Some people are trying to add these things. But if you want uh, transactions and all that, that's very difficult to code to get right, which actually MySQL already has uh, managed to get right. <coughs> so what Vitesse tries to do is actually kind of go in the middle. Uh, it gives, it basically takes MySQL and uh, makes trade-offs on the relational aspects of it and kind of push it closer towards NoSQL, but not all the way. So which means that uh, you can scale, 
uh, you can uh, you can keep on sharding, you can keep on growing, uh, but you also uh, don't lose transactions, you don't lose um, joins and indexes. So that's more or less uh, what we test is. Basically, again, our philosophy is make the right trade <coughs> so that you don't lose everything. Um, so this is the kind of the, this is the, what I'm going to go through is more or less the story that YouTube went through when we started to scale. When YouTube was founded, it was just one simple single database. Uh, but uh, as soon as you do here, you'll run into one of those problems sooner or later as you start to scale. Your data size can go too big. It may not fit in one database. Your QPS could be too high. The database may not be able to uh, uh, give you the QPS that you want. Uptime becomes a problem because sometimes you have to do maintenance on it. You go alter a table, then you have to bring down the database. You have to take backup. <coughs> That's also another problem. Crash recovery, uh, sometimes it crashes and then you lost all your data. And uh, also, um, <coughs> eventually, sometimes uh, the number of connections you make to the database can also be, uh, become a problem. Uh, the reason why I say let's ignore this for now is because usually number of connections is, um, is a problem that you face when you've uh, gone far ahead with your scaling solutions. So the, the first thing that people do is uh, add replicas. Uh, there's a master database, and you add replication. That immediately gives you a big breath of fresh air. A whole bunch of problems are solved. There's no backup issues because you can take backup from a replica. You can distribute your, uh, distribute your reads across multiple replicas, so there's no more issues with reads. Uh, your QPS goes up, and uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, like I mentioned, there's no issue. With, uh, if there is a crash, you can immediately fail over to a new replica and continue serving. So this is uh, actually the biggest bang for the buck you can get from uh, trying to scale MySQL. But uh, this uh, is not enough. Eventually, uh, the next problem that you'll end up solving is that uh, uh, sometimes you want to use replicas for full table scans where you're doing like uh, MapReduce kind of stuff where you're at the mining data. And then uh, you want to also at the same time serve OLTP traffic, which means that the web servers are hitting the, the database. The query patterns are very different, and uh, for cache to be uh, efficient, you usually split the data into categories. You say, I'll reserve one database for just MapReduce kind of jobs where you can do your full table scans, and then I'll reserve another uh, database for uh, web traffic, which will basically do random access reads into give me the info about this user and that kind of stuff. So that improves utilization. Actually, that will buy you some time in terms of scalability because uh, you basically used uh, uh, different caching to make sure that um, uh, you can keep working with the hardware that you have. But eventually, this will also run out of scheme because you still uh, out of steam uh, because uh, eventually write QPS is going to become a problem. Uh, there is only one master and you can't keep on increasing the write traffic to that master at some point of time the disk is going to say, I can't write any faster than I'm writing now, <coughs> is when the next thing that happens uh, where we do sharding, where we say, okay, we split the master into uh, ranges. Uh, all of you are familiar with sharding? Uh, I assume, yeah. So you split, uh, split the master into ranges, which means that you divide your write traffic. So write QPS is gone as a problem. Data size is not a problem anymore because sharding solves that problem also. Uh, but then you've introduced some new problems. Uh, you've introduced the problem of tracking categories. Uh, you've introduced the problem of, tra of uh, um, write up time because, uh, uh, hold on, write up time. Uh, yes, write up time because uh, you cannot, uh, if, um, if a data center goes down, then there's no place to fail over to. Uh, there are still, uh, uh, complex client issues, now that you're sharded, your client becomes a lot more complex because they have to figure out where to send the traffic. Uh, the resharding itself is a problem with MySQL because MySQL allows you only to replicate an entire database to another. It doesn't allow you to split a database when it replicates. Uh, and uh, <coughs> the number of databases is also growing, so that also becomes a growing problem because you don't know uh, when something goes down, you don't know which replica it was, so you need to start tracking all these things. And uh, like I mentioned, disaster recovery is another uh, 
problem that you, you live in. So if you've gone this big, you probably care enough that uh, if an entire data center goes down, you want to be able to recover somewhere else and continue serving traffic. So far, so good. No more questions? No questions so far? OK. And uh, here is what happens when you add new data centers. Now you have a farm of databases. You not in this particular order per se, but this is, this is basically where we are now. We have <coughs> the only things that have, had an, uh, ha have happened on top of this is we now <coughs> multiple of these databases, and we also have um, uh, what we call uh, lookup databases because uh, some of these tables uh, require secondary indexes, and those indexes uh, <coughs> span across multiple shards. And we need a separate database to maintain those indexes. So if you add all that, we have a large number of servers. And uh, we could not just have some people have a file as a list of um, um, a JSON file that described these things. We needed a lot more than uh, just uh, maintaining, uh, maintaining this list. So this is where um, we thought of a lock server. Uh, Zookeeper is the common open source lock server. How many of you are uh, not familiar with Zookeeper? OK. So Zookeeper is uh, uh, what we call as a lock server. It's basically a, a s I would say a single point of failure. But the way they solve that single point of failure problem is they have three or four multiple servers that keep talking to each other and exchanging data very quickly to make sure that if one server goes down, the other one still has the data. There is something called the Paxos algorithm that they use, uh, which is um, uh, very, la uh, very latency sensitive, which means that typically a lock server is very good for um, atomically updating data. Uh, but you have to limit how much you use it, because if you write too much data to it, it kind of falls apart. But you need it because uh, when you take a server down, when you say, oh, I'm changing the master from this database to that database, uh, that change has to be atomically updated somewhere so that everybody else receives that update atomically. So they are very useful, uh, but uh, if you, you should know how to use them. Uh, so the lock server uh, that we use for the open source is Zookeeper. And internally in Google, we use uh, Chubby. Uh, how many of you have heard of uh, Chubby? OK. So uh, Chubby and Zookeeper are functionally equivalent. Uh, so internally, we use uh, Chubby. Uh, what it uh, keeps track of is uh, key spaces. Uh, key space is basically what is a logical database. Like a, data a database that is sharded into 10-way is one key space. Like we have a user key space. We have a claim key space. Uh, so that's what a key space. It keeps track of the shard graph. It says each database is now split 16 ways or 32 ways. Uh, it tells you the ranges that we split them by. It keeps track of the list of master databases, but there's only one master per, uh, um, and then a whole bunch of replicas, uh, one master per shard. And it also keeps a list of data centers. You say, uh, right now we are running in five data centers, and these are the lists, or seven data centers. And each data center also has its own lock server, uh, which uh, keeps track of how many replicas are running there, what are the categories, and uh, where, if you want to read data from uh, a database, where should you go? Uh, that's the serving graph. Uh, the reason why we split it is for uh, fault tolerance, which means that uh, if the global server goes down, we continue to serve traffic because there is a local lock server available. If the local lock server goes down, there's still other data centers that can uh, take traffic. All right, going well so far. Uh, so there are uh, so to uh, uh, to work with these lock servers, we wrote some tools. Uh, there's 
one big tool which we call VTCTL, uh, which stands for VT control. Using this tool, you do all your operations for VTS. You can say VTCTL, do a reshard. You can do VTCTL, do a reparent. Uh, so VT, you would say VTCTL, and there's like about 20, 25 commands that you can issue. Pretty much everything that you need to do to maintain that big farm of databases that uh, I showed, you can do using VTCTL. The way it does it is it um, registers an action inside the log server saying that I'm going to do this work, and then goes and performs the work, and then comes back and updates the log server, OK, the work is done. And then all other services are listening on that log server, and then they pick up from there and uh, react to it accordingly, depending on what the change was. So there is also a web server that kind of uh, reads from that log server and tells you where things are. So if you go to the web server, it'll say, OK, these are your masters. These are the databases that you have. These are the replicas. And you can click on each replica and look at what is going on there. So that's just a uh, convenience. Uh, and then, uh, any questions? Yeah. And then we have servers. Uh, these servers, uh, we wrote them for um, uh, both simplification, improving performance, as well as uh, management. So VT Tablet. Uh, actually is a proxy server. Every MySQL instance uh, that we run, there's a VT tablet in front of it. Actually, none of our applications directly talk to MySQL anymore. They all go through VT tablet. It gives you an RPC API, and you send it queries, and then it returns, que it returns results for those queries. So pretty <coughs> much, as far as the application is concerned, you are talking to a database engine. You don't even know that it's MySQL, even though underneath it is MySQL. The first thing that VT Tablet did was to pool connections. For example, uh, when we, uh, at some point of time, this was in 2011, we ran out of, we ran out, for the, out of memory because our connections were so high. Um, at, I think at about, we were at about 4,000 connections, and MySQL just couldn't handle more than that. And when a server went down, a new server came up, and like, all web servers connected to it and made 4,000 connections, MySQL would immediately die again. So it's like uh, the, loo the thundering herd loop of death where you are never able to <laughs> recover. So the first thing that uh, VT Tablet did was um, accept as many connections as you like and then pool it into a limited number of connections. Uh, actually, if you uh, MySQL, you can max out MySQL with just eight connections. Uh, if you have eight connections and you pound it with queries, MySQL will be maxed out. You do not need more connections than that. So uh, actually, uh, in reality, we run about 24 connections because some people didn't uh, are still not trusting that you can max out MySQL with eight connections. So we run it at 24, but you don't really need 24 connections. But on the front end, right now, uh, VT Tablet uh, receives like uh, uh, up to 40,000 connections so far. That's the highest number of connections that we have. In terms of memory cost of that, uh, each MySQL con connection costs about around uh, 2 megabytes. Uh, that's amount, uh, uh, how much it requests. And multiply that by 40,000 and look at how much memory we saved. And that's how VT Tablet makes MySQL go faster, because if you send all those connections to MySQL, it would barely perform. Uh, Apart from that, what VT Tablet does is it also uh, syncs in with the log server. And if some work that needs to be done, like for example, if you want to take a backup, you can uh, go to VTCTL and, and issue a, say, OK, issue a, uh, take a backup of this database uh, and using the following VT Tablet. Then log server, uh, then um, VTCTL st uh, stores a command on the log server, uh, assigns a command to VT Tablet to execute. And VT Tablet says, oh, I need to take a backup. Let me stop my query service. Let me stop my replication and me take a backup. And once the backup is done, I'll come back and then restart replication and go back into uh, serving mode. So those are things, a uh, large number of workflows, basically, that are common when you are running a, um, running a big uh, farm of databases are all automated through VTES. The VT Gates query server solves the complex client problem. Uh, it's actually one level above VT Tablet. Uh, what it does is um, acts as 
a single server and uh, hides the fact that there are multiple shards in the background. So when you want to, uh, so right now we are at a phase where we are transitioning from VT tablet to VT gate. We should be done with the VT gate migration in about a month or two. And uh, that should also, uh, it's available right now, but uh, it's, it's in the process of, uh, it's not functionally fully complete. But once that is complete, <coughs> you will stop connecting to VT tablet, you will connect to VT gate. Its API is very similar to VT tablet, except that instead of talking to a single MySQL server, you are talking to the entire farm. So at that point, you send it a query, and then VT gate will look at your query and say, oh, okay, I need to send this to the following two shards, and then get the response. It also uh, takes care of if there is a, if the master changes from one database to another, VT gate notices that saying that, oh, you wanted to do a write, uh, but the master just went down. Here's the new master, I'll send the query here instead. Mm -hmm. So all the complexities of the big farm behind, uh, 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 behind the VT gate is hidden by it, and uh, then the, the application remains simple. Uh, so that should help you with uh, as you. In our case, we actually uh, we actually have a complex client, and now we are simplifying it. But once Vitesse is released, uh, if you have a simple client, it will remain simple because as you um, as you scale, you just continue using one uh, one server, which is VT Gate, and it will keep hiding the fact that you are sharding underneath. Uh, here is a uh, uh, view of how things will uh, how things stand you can see that uh, there's mysql databases in the bottom and there's a vt tablet one each for each of those and there's a vt gate that sits in front and the application just connects to vt gate uh, this means that vt gate has actually a sql parser vt tablet also has a sql parser which i'll talk more about uh, as we go uh, they so they understand queries they uh, they know what to do with them and uh, VT tablet and VT gate uh, talk to the metadata, which is the log server, uh, Zookeeper in our case. And uh, on the other end, VTCTL, using VTCTL, you issue commands. Those commands uh, get updated in the metadata, and these guys pick up the change or perform actions if uh, something needs to be done. Uh, this is uh, the view. And VTCTLD is something that is there for you to browse what's going on in there. We have some command line tools also uh, called ZK where uh, you have file system like an API, you can do zkls slash uh, vt slash uh, master, show me this, and then it'll give you nice uh, JSON files that you can look at uh, to see, uh, to that represents uh, the metadata. Uh, any questions on this so far? So far, so good. All right, I'm going to speed up because I want to also spend time talking about Go. So this is basically what Vitesse does for you, is it takes you from point A to point B, uh, hopefully with uh, not you having to rewrite your app a lot based on the fact that you are changing things underneath. Uh, so uh, why servers? Uh, mainly because uh, the problem with MySQL is that um, it uh, it's a relational database at heart, and it is meant to stick to the contract of a relational database, which means that there are some very tough decisions, compromises that it has to make. For example, transactional safety. You have to have transactional safety, otherwise you are not a relational database. You have to have isolation, <coughs> otherwise you are not a relational database. So uh, what we can do is we can say, well, do you, how much of transaction safety do you need? We can start negotiating. So we did those negotiations within ourselves and said, okay, these are some of the things we can trade off uh, for which we can get some scaling. <coughs> like I mentioned, cost of connections is a big concern. Uh, and MySQL has to do it because they need to isolate one user from another and what they do uh, between each other. And therefore, MySQL cannot do it, but we can. We can say, well, we'll accept 40,000 connections and we'll, we'll have a pool of 24 connections connected as just one user and we'll just rotate them uh, as we need. So then we can afford to do that. So we solve the connection problem. Uh, MySQL doesn't know how to judge your queries. Any query you give, it has to give you an answer and it will work hard and at the cost of other queries. So that actually is a problem in a web app because there is one query that is expensive that can bring the entire database down 
and that uh, will cause an outage on your web server. So what VT Tablet does is it looks at your query and says, uh, is this query safe to send to MySQL? How come you don't have a limit on your clause? So you don't have a limit on your clause, I'm going to slap a limit there and make sure that you don't ret return more than n rows because you are serving a web app, you shouldn't be asking for a full table scan, for example. So you, uh, when it uh, sees queries like that, it puts limits and protects the database. And like, if it sees that a query is running for too long because uh, maybe it's scanning some index, it'll go kill it. Say, oh, this query is running for too long, I'm not going to allow it to run. So while it makes these decisions, what it helps with is uh, it helps the website running because other well-behaved queries continue uh, getting served. Uh, the other problem it solves is uh, the MySQL buffer cache is designed for um, table scans, which means that when you read one row, it will not read just that row, it will read the entire block of memory, uh, block of uh, block that the row is stored in. And those are 16K blocks, and if your rows are only like 10 bytes each, for every row that you're reading, you're reading 16K uh, blocks of rows. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is actually good if you're doing full table scans, you're doing, uh, doing MapReduce kind of work, but it's not very good for web traffic because web traffic is say, show me information about this user, show me information about this video. So uh, what uh, VT Tablet does is have an alternate cache, which we call the row cache, which uh, caches only rows. And it, uh, it actually, I'll talk about a little bit more about that um, later. And that row cache increases uh, MySQL serving capacity by many fold, uh, something like 8x. Like a typical MySQL server would be able to do about 10,000 QPS. If you added a buffer cache uh, for the right kind of web traffic, you can probably uh, multiply that up by eight times. Like, uh, we, have, uh, we haven't really maxed it out yet, but I've seen like uh, typically uh, query QPS in the range of like 80,000 from just one box, and we are barely using like half the CPU, half the CPU that the box has. Uh, so th there is a lot you can get out of it. Uh, typically people use memcache, uh, but the problem with memcache, uh, like applications do their own memcache solutions, but the problem with that is that the memcache becomes stale because how do you keep it up to date? Uh, whereas VT Tablet uh, keeps uh, the row cache up to date, which means that uh, the data that you get is as up to date as the database that you are getting it from. Uh, so MySQL doesn't blacklist queries. For example, if you see that uh, there is a query that's causing a lot of trouble, you can immediately go to VT Tablet and say, okay, don't allow this query anymore, and then uh, it'll start returning errors on those queries so that uh, your site can keep uh, running. And also when, when eventually when <coughs> MySQL starts to run out of steam, it doesn't tell you much about why. It's very difficult to find out why MySQL is suffering. Uh, there are some tools where you, which you can use to run, but this is where uh, actually now, this was actually a very unimport uh, unimportant part of VT Tablet, but now it's actually one of its greatest strengths. It tells you everything that's going on, and it's very useful. It tells you in this query category, uh, this is the query category that's actually causing you problems. This is the table that's causing you problems. So it can give you stat, give you stat about table level. You can actually, uh, if you have absolutely no clue what's going on, you can say, okay, give me a dump of all the queries, every query that executes and every uh, stat about that query. How long did you spend waiting for MySQL? How long did you, uh, how many rows did you return? How much memory did you use? So it tells you everything. And then you can, um, uh, it comes as a, awk, a file that's awkable and then you can run your whatever tools that you like to analyze and say, okay, this is the query that's causing problems. So that's, uh, uh, that's actually one of the things that we have used a lot of recently. Uh, whenever there's an outage, uh, okay, let's go look at the table stats, let's look at the <coughs> query stats and let's see what, uh, what's going on there. And on the other side, uh, because of the fact that we have shards, uh, sharded, we need some abstraction. We need the application to remain simple, and that is the other part that uh, we need servers for. All right. I am going to now skip through because I want to spend more time uh, talking about Go. Uh, um, but I've already covered the important things uh, about uh, VT Tablet. Uh, 
connection pooling I've talked about. Oh, results reuse is another cool thing. Like um, if, if um, let's say your front page has uh, some information and it's causing query spam. Like there's one query that's executed at 5,000 QPS and it's just one query, it's always the same result. So what VT Tablet does is that every query that it is, is currently running on um, against MySQL, it, it knows that that query is currently executing. If any re new requests come in that are the exact same query, it doesn't send it. It just waits for the result of that query to come and then returns that same result to everyone else. It's brain dead stuff, but you, I can't, believe, I can't uh, tell you how much it has saved us because uh, YouTube is a site where a video suddenly becomes popular or somebody who has 250,000 videos, they suddenly get uh, featured on the index page and suddenly the index page is making, is fetching 250,000 videos for every index hit. So when these things happen, uh, VT Tablet saves you by just saying that at any given point of time, only one of those queries will run, not 10,000 of them. So. Um, uh, VT Tablet has an SQL parser, which means that uh, uh, we invested into a parser because we felt that once we can parse, we can we can have better control, and that's beginning to pay off. There's uh, lots of cool tricks we can do. Uh, we can now blacklist queries by cap, by all kinds of things that uh, tip you typically cannot. And uh, I've talked about the row cache. Uh, Oh, the other thing that we can use the row cache for, that VT Tablet can use the row cache for, is uh, not just for primary key lookups. Like if there is a query that comes that requires an index scan, uh, what VT Tablet does is uh, it looks at the query. Oh, it looks like this is going to be an index scan. So let me just scan the index, get the list of primary keys, and then see how much of it is in the row cache already. And uh, then I get the stuff from the row cache. The only stuff that uh, I go to MySQL for is stuff that is not in the row cache yet. So it also makes uh, MySQL go faster uh, with those techniques. Uh, there are also fail safes that uh, I, I uh, talked to about. Uh, there's transaction management. Uh, I limit the row counts. I limit uh, the number of transactions. MySQL will die if you open too many transactions. If you have too, uh, if you have uh, over a thousand uh, transactions open, it'll just die with uh, rollback segment uh, errors. Uh, I have timeouts. We have blacklisting. So all these things basically have helped YouTube uh, stay up. Uh, and also, uh, we have uh, uh, DML annotations, which means that every uh, query, every write query that comes in, we know which row it changes. Uh, that we can later use for other things. Uh, that I'm going to skip because I'm beginning to run out of time. <laughs> so here's what uh, a block diagram of VT Tablet. Uh, there's an RPC service on top, which actually we use Go's RPC for. There's a query parser which actually caches plans, which means that a query is not uh, is passed only once. Once it is passed, then uh, there is a uh, execution plan that is built for it, and then we reuse only the execution plan. Uh, there are, uh, uh, it goes through the query rules to make sure that nothing is blacklisted. It reuses results. There's a connection pool and there's a transaction pool. Uh, the MySQL writes uh, every uh, statement into the bin log. And that bin log, uh, we now have tools that parse those bin logs and uh, do lots of cool tricks with it. One of it is to invalidate the <coughs> row cache. So if you, um, uh, if you made a statement that changed a row, uh, what we do is we read that, we continuously read that bin log. It says, oh, this row has changed. Let me invalidate the row cache. So that is how we keep the row cache consistent with the database. Uh, we also use it for filtered replication. So when you say, I want to shard my database into 16 or into 8, uh, the filtered replication can read each statement and um, split the rows. This is something that you can't do with MySQL standard replication. But you can, uh, when you want to do sharding, it will do the split. And uh, we have a workflow that, uh, that fully automates this, which means that you say, go, reshard, and this is the uh, key space ID. This is the key on which you have to do the sharding. And uh, VTCTL will start the workflow that will initiate this filter replication. So basically, at the end of replication, you will say, <coughs> replication is done. You are ready to switch traffic from the old scheme to the new scheme, and then you do the scheme. It should take a few seconds to switch. 
and then you're up on the new scheme with multiplied read and write capacity. And uh, there is also the update stream, which is uh, if you want to export uh, your data continuously to uh, an external server like uh, Bigtable or uh, any other service uh, that you want to store into for other processing that you want to do, you can subscribe to the update stream. And that will tell you that that will basically stream a list of rows that are continuously changing. So you don't have to keep on doing full table scans to get, a, get an update of what has changed. All right. Vitesse is production ready. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, unfortunately, right now only uh, we can operate it. Uh, uh, it's not quite ready for unsupervised use, but it will be ready very soon. We are very, very close, uh, probably in about two months. Uh, you can download it. It builds. We use it internally. It's just that we don't have enough documentation, and we are also making changes. Uh, like uh, we are uh, changing the APIs a little bit and stuff. So you can download and play around with it, uh, but um, uh, you can probably use it for um, production also. I mean, we use it, uh, except <coughs> that uh, uh, you, may you may need to send us a lot of emails and we may have to answer a lot of questions uh, if you have issues, which we'll be glad to do. Uh, we are a team of five people, so, and we are all super excited about this project. Uh, uh, here's some stats for you. Uh, BT Tablet you serves all of YouTube's MySQL traffic. It's been in production since 2011. We have between 10 to 40,000 connections. And these connections, like when a server goes down and we bring up a new master, these 40,000 connections get made within a few seconds. So you bring, up, you, you bring down a master, bring it up a new one, Within five seconds, all 40,000 connections have been made. No downtime, no thundering heard. This uh, is, I, I take no credit for it. I actually, it's all thanks to the Go runtime because it's really, really that efficient. It's just Go code. Um, it vastly increases MySQL serving capacity. And uh, uh, if you operate at this size, the thing that you value most is uh, the logging and statistics. And you want to know everything that's going on, uh, because when there is trouble, uh, you need information. And that's what uh, VT Tablet gives you. <coughs> and uh, we are getting to uh, getting ready to launch ProCache. We have done uh, benchmark tests. They are looking very promising. <coughs> uh, in terms of QPS, uh, we serve about 500,000 uh, QPS, approximately. That's, uh, that's what VT, uh, well over 500,000 is what I would say. And uh, once, once row cache gets enabled, uh, there's going to be an order of magnitude increase. Probably uh, it'll increase to two to three million uh, QPS is um, uh, what we are looking at. We, we only have estimates. Uh, we, don't have, we don't know exactly. Maybe the next time I'll talk about this, uh, row cache would be launched. Uh, so basically, all Go code, huge QPS. Uh, you should have no fear of Go scaling. <laughs> uh, YouTube completely depends on it. There was one outage uh, when uh, all our databases went down due to operator error, nothing related to Go, and YouTube was down for an entire hour completely. Total blackout. It was probably in the news. It happened uh, a month ago, I think. <laughs> yeah, every time YouTube goes down, it's the news. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, uh, I will jump into Go. Uh, the, these are final words. Uh, Google, we depend on Google MySQL. There is something called Group ID uh, that uh, we need, uh, which is uh, very important for remastering. Uh, so we, need, we, we do depend on Google MySQL. Uh, we are going to, we are looking at MariaDB compatibility, and uh, the later versions of MySQL have uh, a Group ID also. Uh, we just have to <coughs> test against them. Uh, we use Zookeeper, use Go 1.2. Awesome. Go 1.2 uh, made some of the best changes that uh, Vitesse uh, gained from. Uh, we use Python mostly for clients. Uh, and uh, we have other miscellaneous tools which you can get through uh, AppGate. I'm going to skip over VTGate. Uh, so the RPC protocol that we use is actually a fork of uh, Go's RPC. The only thing that we have added we, is a call context, which means that uh, every time 
Uh, you get called, there is a context that tells you which IP it's coming from, because that was important. When there is a server-side problem, you will say, oh, there's this query that's bad. Uh, I don't know where the query is coming from. And then it, the call context tells you which IP it's coming from. We also added streaming for it, uh, uh, because uh, if, you do, if you're doing a full table scan, a simple synchronous RPC API is not enough. So those are two things that we added. And there are a few, few more things that we uh, added. We added some security, SASL authentication, SSL. Uh, we right now support uh, BSON, GOB, and JSON. That way, Ghost RPC is very modular. You can plug in any encoding that you want, and it's very simple. Uh, these are the things that we support natively, but if you want to add thrift or protobufs, it should, it should not be a problem. Uh, and we support Go and Python clients. All right, finally, uh, Go experience. Uh, Vitess and Go. Uh, it was rough in the beginning, I have to be honest, uh, because when we started using Go, it was not mature. Uh, some of the biggest challenges we use, uh, we faced were, uh, uh, were uh, let's see, uh, some of the biggest challenges were with respect to uh, garbage collection, uh, the runtime scheduler, uh, the ePoll, uh, the, the network code. But um, I have to s say special thanks to Dimitri, who uh, single-handedly solved all those problems for, for us. <laughs> I don't know if, how many of you uh, don't know Dimitri. You do not know Dimitri. Dimitri Yukov is a contributor to Go. It's his 20% project, or so he claims. <laughs> his contributions are may way more than 100% uh, contributions from other people, is all I can say. Um, and uh, let's talk about, here's, uh, uh, I just want to uh, give you a, a challenge. Here's more or less what, uh, I, you now know what we test does. Uh, take an estimate of how many lines of code it has. Any estimates? 20,000. 20,000? 6,000? 6,000. Come on. It's an entire, entire server. Two million, okay, I hear something. <laughs> 50,000. 50, okay, I last checked it was 70,000. Uh, well, uh, only we know, we've been writing this in for three years now. Uh, if we had written it in C++, I have written a lot of C++ in the past, it wouldn't have been anything less than 200,000. Uh, no questions asked. I mean, imagine having to implement RPC protocols, having to implement encoding and decoding, having to implement <coughs> memcache clients. I actually looked at the memcache client that is written in C++. That itself is 15,000 lines of code. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zookeeper client, MySQL client, BSON protocol. So uh, it's very, very compact for what it does, is all I can say. Uh, here's some numbers. Like I wrote an LRU cache, 224 lines of code. Connection pooler, 260 lines. Memcache client, 280 lines, uh, not 15,000 lines. Uh, I, I, I don't know, I, probably, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 2,000 lines. Uh, I, I, I could, have you seen the memcache client code? The Google free one? Uh, no, the, there's a public API one. Uh, oh, anyway, it was a l it was a order of magnitude bigger than what we have. Like I said, we had, uh, we, uh, we had challenges. Initially, when we did the benchmarks, RPC just wouldn't. It, it was slower than Python. Then Rob uh, spent a week on it and then made it better. Then Sego calls became a bottleneck. Then Russ came and spent a week on it and he made it better. Uh, after that, we launched. Uh, after those two were solved, he said, okay, this is good enough, we are going live. So we launched uh, VT and then uh, the garbage collector started becoming a problem because uh, at, uh, at one point of time, we were bottlenecked by VT code. Like, VT code would be the first one to run out of steam and we couldn't increase QPS. And that was because of the garbage collector. And then Dimitri stepped in and uh, rewrote the garbage collector, which now uses uh, 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 all CPUs. And that at, after he rewrote that thing, garbage collector just fell off our radar. Um, we just never thought about garbage collector anymore. Then the network IO and the runtime scheduler had to be rewritten, which again Dimitri rewrote. Um, <laughs> and uh, now it's awesome. I, I can say it just uh, Go code just screams. Um, I, I'll, I'll share. Um, 
Actually, in the other thing, I didn't talk about the latency. Um, we serve uh, this 500,000 QPS, and we are going to be serving millions of QPS now. And the average latency, client-side latency, which means that Python code that encodes the request, sends it, gets back the results, decodes it, the average latency that we have is two milliseconds. There is not many data stores that will give you that kind of latency. Uh, so that's how fast uh, Go code can go. Uh, here is a, uh, oh my god, I'm going to skip all this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, tools, uh, here I would talk about debug pprof and debug vars. Those are your friends. If you're going to scale, those are two things that uh, will tell you where uh, you're using memory, where you're using CPU, uh, and uh, debug vars, uh, export a lot of variables about what you're doing, and that will tell you uh, internals about what's going on. Uh, let's see. I, I, I want to skip over to, oh, this I need to talk about. I, I, <laughs> you have to talk about generics, right? <laughs> so generics. You don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. <laughs> uh, there are three kinds of generics. Okay? If you say Go doesn't have generics, then you haven't used the language. There is something called high-level generics. <coughs> In my opinion, if you are going to write over 10,000 lines of code, that is all you need. You need high-level generics. And you achieve those using interfaces. Uh, you can use closures also. I'll show you some techniques that I've used. Uh, it re requires a little bit of forethought, which means that if you are going to say that this code needs to be generic, all you need to do is think of an interface and not a struct. Uh, and we all know it's not efficient with primitive types. Um, that uh, there is also the language-defined generics. Like for example, if you used a map, if you used a slice, uh, those can be of any type, and uh, that's not a problem. Uh, it's these other low-level generics that everyone complains about, which requires code generation. Which means that I have a linked list of x. Right. Um, my answer to those who want those low-level generics: use the following technique. And then don't ask about generics anymore. <laughs> uh, here is a uh, uh, min.go that I wrote in five minutes. Uh, as you can see, it takes a generic type, returns a generic, and returns basically the min. And the way I achieve genericity is by running gofint and say, substitute generic to int, and then you have a generic int. And uh, <laughs> like this, you can have as many generic uh, data structure implementations as you like. As a matter of fact, I tried this against uh, container list, where I ran gofm substitute interface to int. It generated an integer linked list. And my job is done. So uh, this is something that you can automate. You can part make it part of a make file. It's a solution outside, outside <coughs> the language that you can use. All right. Um, I know C++, I know Python, I've heard of Java, I think it's a language or something. So, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, uh, so I can't talk much about it. Um, C++ versus Go, you almost always uh, would choose Go, unless performance is super, super critical, something like memcache. Uh, you would choose C++. If you're going for a real-time system where the response time has to be guaranteed, maybe you'd choose C++. Otherwise, everything else, Go is better. Uh, Readability-wise, there's type safety. Don't tell me C++ is type safe. It's not. Uh, compiler speed, platform independence. I mean, long. I mean, how many bytes does it take? Oh, it's platform dependent. Well, then it's whatever. Uh, debuggability and null terminated, uh, ter null terminated strings, that's a mistake, in my opinion. Uh, Python versus Go? I would say if you're writing small programs, Python still wins. I still, if I have to write something quick, get something out, test something quickly, just fire up Python and do it. Uh, but when your co uh, code uh, exceeds a thousand lines, uh, it starts to run out of steam, you start to miss the the <coughs> formality that Go has where you can say, this is what I expect and, and all that. All right, I'm going to um, skip through all this and give you one cool example. Oh, here is one. Uh, 
actually I'm going to skip this because a lot of people have talked about interfaces and you all know how to <laughs> yeah. use it. Uh, here is a cool one. This actually we stole from Brad. Uh, he doesn't know that we stole it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so here is uh, int64, and uh, I, uh, the sync, uh, sync slash atomic is not very cool to use because you have to pass it addresses of values. Instead, what we did here was define those atomic functions on top of an int64. And so now this int64 is a type on which I can do atomic operations, uh, just like it was a normal type. And uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, <coughs> oh, closures. Uh, closures are actually, uh, in my opinion, underutilized in Go because people are scared because they have they are slightly syntactically uh, weird, but they are very, very powerful. Closures basically are first-class citizens in Go. You can create them anywhere, use them anywhere, maps, slices, function arguments, and uh, here is an example of a cool <coughs> usage. So I have, uh, I have a... Um, um, an implementation that uh, that has to do begin and execute. Uh, they are different functions. It has different, like you see, begin actually just returns an error, execute, accepts a query, and returns a result. But then both these functions have to be executed on a connection, but I want to add retry logic. Uh, I want to say, oh, if it's a failure, then I want to retry three times, and then after I retry three times, only then I have to return an error. So in this case, what I do is I have written a with retry function that's completely independent of these two. What it, what it accepts is actually another function and uh, uh, calls that function, looks, uh, looks at the return value, and then if the return value is fine, it returns it, otherwise it retries. And uh, the problem typically is that if begin and execute uh, had the same signature, you could have defined retry to have that. But in this case, they have different signatures. So the technique I use is that within begin, I say return with retry, and I create a function on the fly that satisfies the interface that with retry expects. And then uh, it calls internally begin and returns a correct error. But then uh, in execute, as you see, it, uh, it does the same thing except that it uh, sets a local variable as the result and returns the result at the end. So you can do, uh, I, yeah, I think you must be familiar with Python's uh, closures, uh, Python's de uh, decorators. Uh, so this is kind of similar to that. I thought it's a, uh, so basically a closure is basically <coughs> a single interface function. That's basically how you see it. And some of these cool things you can do with, uh, here is a, another example of an anonymous closure where uh, I begin a function, uh, do a lock, and then in the middle I have to unlock maybe to wait or something. I can create a local function right within and do uh, my wait operation within that. The, uh, the reason why I do this because I can use defer inside a function. Uh, switch on types are cool. There are many places where you can use this instead of enums. And uh, Vitas has a bunch of reusable parts. Uh, you can <coughs> reuse the Bison library. Uh, we can use uh, Bytes too. Basically, it's same as uh, Bytes, except that it's a chunk writer, which means that it doesn't keep on appending and reallocating memory. It just keeps uh, uh, allocates in chunks and then gives you still a Bytes interface. Uh, LRU cache, uh, I've seen a few people uh, use it uh, because it's kind of generic. Uh, CGZip, uh, faster uh, GZip, basically it traps the C API. Uh, uh, memcache client, if you like to use it, it's a very simple one. Uh, I think Brad has written one which is uh, sharded, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a MySQL API which is also bare bones. Uh, connection pools, uh, you can use that generic library if you would like to use that. Uh, we have the uh, proc, which actually lets you restart a server without a downtime. It negotiates with the previous <coughs> server, transfers the listener, and then uh, you never uh, miss a beat when you're serving traffic. RPC Plus I've talked about. There is a stats package that we have, which is built on top of EXP var that gives you more advanced um, stat values. Uh, Sync 2 I've talked about. 
and the timer is for housekeeping. You can go look at uh, the repository. Uh, this is our dev team. Uh, the, we are five of us right now and uh, very excited. We have now some operational people also that uh, know with us pretty well in uh, uh, Google. We are hiring. <laughs> All right. Okay, we have six minutes of questions. <coughs> yes. What are some of typical queries uh, that you blacklist? Like some <coughs> types of queries that you said that you can <coughs> usually uh, blacklist or identify that with the parser you can. Uh, so the question is, what types of query uh, do you blacklist? Uh, uh, where the, how does the parser help with the blacklisting? So one example was uh, uh, there was uh, so the the parser actually when it um, this was actually something that I initially used a blacklist for, then I eventually removed the blacklist to actually make it hard coded in the code. Uh, was when um, uh, the parser, when it creates an execution plan, it says uh, this is the category of uh, execution plan that I've done. And one of the plans was pass through DML, which means that the parser says this DML is complex, uh, but I'm going to let it pass uh, because uh, we still haven't cleaned up the code base yet. Uh, so then we went and cleaned up the code base uh, and don't have any of that category anymore. We didn't want to allow any more of those. Then I say, go to the query blacklister and say, anything that comes as a pass through DML, don't allow. And then add the rule, and then it stops allowing it. But uh, now we have said that uh, we don't want to ever allow pass through DML, so we went and hard coded it in the code and removed the rule. That's one example. But you can blacklist by uh, uh, other things. If it's an insert statement, if it's a um, uh, select star, you can do uh, regular expressions and stuff. It's pretty powerful. Yes. So this is not really goal related, more with the first part of your talk. Yes. Uh, you, and you mentioned it yourself that you, in YouTube you have lots of content which <coughs> get very quickly, and I guess this will fade out and they will belong to the long tail. And my question is, now that you have automated all this sharding and so forth in MySQL, have you done anything to actually make more popular content also more replicated? Do you do this automatically or not? I didn't fully understand the <laughs> purpose of your question. So I you can rephrase it quickly. Yeah, yeah. Since you are automating sharding yes. and you get tools for that, are you also trying to adapt the reputation of your MySQL databases to how popular the content is? Uh, oh, okay. So the question is, uh, do you, are you smart about how you uh, shard the database to... Uh, uh, no, we don't. Actually, uh, uh, we did an analysis. Uh, that uh, of our query traffic to see if there are any hot areas, and uh, we didn't find that uh, uh, the, we didn't find any pockets that we felt like was worthy enough. Uh, <coughs> so the only the only technique we used was our user IDs increase sequentially. Uh, so what we did was that's not a good idea because when then new users will end up in just one database all the time. So we hashed the user ID and then sharded equally uh, using that. Uh, that has been uh, good enough. Our, um, we do know that it could happen. Uh, so if it does happen, our game plan is to shard very narrow if there is a hot spot. If, for example, a particular user or a set of users end up within the same zone, we could shard very narrowly there. The shards don't have to be uniform, so we can just narrow down that thing into a separate shard, but we haven't had to do this so far. Uh, the question is, uh, are transactions still supported in Vitesse? Uh, the, the answer is yes, in a limited fashion. We give you guarantee within a uh, shard or within a key space. Uh, if it uh, goes beyond key spaces, then uh, the way we recommend you do it is sequence your uh, DMLs in such a way that you can recover from it. We are actually writing tools that uh, will uh, do consistency checks. Uh, those are coming. Yes. To talk to the, to the SQL database, uh, uh, we wrote our own client library, uh, and um, we have our own SQL parser, 
uh, which actually uh, supports a, which does not support intentionally all constructs of uh, SQL because they are not all good. You don't want to do uh, roll ups and stuff with uh, MySQL when you are serving web, tra web traffic, so those things we don't allow. Oh, the uh, Go's uh, standard library? Oh, uh, oh actually, uh, uh, there is a different reason why we don't use it. The reason is because uh, we use bind variables, and uh, they are not compatible with, uh, I wasn't able to make it work with uh, Go's standard library. Um, I should talk to Brad about it sometime, <laughs> how, to ma how to make uh, that work. Uh, because we have named bind variables. Uh, they are important for us because that may uniquely identifies a query. Uh, whereas uh, Brad's uh, library supports um, the, the question mark, the anonymous uh, bind variables, which don't work as well. Yes, yes. I mentioned adding SASL support in Office and Plus. Yes. What, what mechanism what SASL mechanism <coughs> The question is uh, what uh, uh, SASL mechanism we use. I didn't implement it. I believe it's CRAM MD5. Uh, if that <coughs> answers your question. Yes, okay. Yes. Awesome. Are you are you aware of anybody else trying to run uh, VPS? I mean, like. Oh, uh, we actually don't know. There were uh, there was uh, there was one person from Russia who uh, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they they went very far. They uh, uh, but they didn't tell us what they were using it for. They uh, they downloaded it. They, <laughs> they kept asking us questions about how to make it work. And we answered all the questions, and uh, once everything got work working, uh, uh, radio silence. So I don't, know <laughs> <what> <laughs> I don't know what they're using it for, or if they are using it. Uh, so we don't know that yet. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Sugar. Thank you.